Department of Studies in Sericulture Science. I was just going through his uh, uh, CV right now, and uh, it says 16 years of chairperson. He has uh, served uh, the department for 16 years as chair chairperson, and he is fellow of Royal Entomological Society of uh, London. He is recipient of uh, Commonwealth Fellowship, uh, uh, which is tenable uh, at a premier institute, the Welcome uh, Trust uh, Stranger Institute. Then he is also a recipient of Indian National Science Academy uh, in, uh, in par with Academy of Science of Zec uh, Republic Scientist Exchange Fellowships. And he is also a recipient of Indo-Canada Fellowship. He has worked in uh, with Nobel Laureate uh, Sir John at Sangar Centre at UK. And he has seven research product, uh, projects to its uh, uh, yeah, which he has been completed. He was coordinator for uh, DST FIST program. Uh, DST BIRAC program and uh, DBT Skill Vigyan uh, State uh, Partnership program. And he has awarded eight students for PhD and presently six are working under him. He has also guided uh, four postdoctoral uh, fellowships under his uh, supervision. He has written a, a book on uh, field to all moths, off moths of the state of Karnataka. And he has uh, three to two bo uh, three book cha chapters in advances in animal genomics and development and application of uh, microfluidics in organized uh, formation. He has 78 publications with highest impact factor of 5.5 uh, and H index 16 and item index 8 and 344 citations for his uh, credit. And another uh, great uh, impact is uh, 12 HSB gene sequence was uploaded by him in NCBI. He is a referee for uh, both national and international uh, journals, and he has reviewed more than 50 research articles. He has delivered about uh, 40 lectures and organized uh, three-day national conferences and two-day frontier lectures, and also conducted five workshops, seminars, and awareness programs. And he has presented research papers in both international and national, uh, which accounts to around uh, 46. And is, uh, he has visited as re uh, various research institutes at uh, London, and he was member for both international and national academic uh, science bodies. He has worked as coordinator for uh, NAC reaccreditation. And he, as I told earlier itself, he has been uh, chairman for 16 years, even for board of studies and board of examiners. He was a member of BIRAC, member of board of uh, appointment. And he has many unique uh, accomplish, uh, accomplishments like identification of four new species and development of uh, silk fibrin and development of each uh, shock uh, technology and evolved around six new bivalutine silkworm uh, breeds and its hybrids and development of silkworm as a human dent uh, dental caries and diabetic model system and development of uh, model uh, application in seri app for precise application and he has uh, research co collaborations or, or mou with uh, zec, ZEC public and also uh, with uh, additive labs private limited and uh, the JSS Academy, and he's also a collaborative researcher for uh, Laboratory of Molecular Cytogenetics Biology Center, which also be, uh, it is a part of INSA ASCR, and it is also in Zip, uh, ZEC Republic. I think uh, with this uh, brief accomplishments, maybe it's uh, longer bio data, maybe around pages, but uh, with this uh, small introduction, I welcome you to this session, sir. Thank you very much. Sir, I think you need to unmute. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for the brief introduction about me and my work. In fact, uh, I thank uh, Professor uh, Rajkumar, who is a coordinator for this particular course, for giving me an opportunity to share my experience as well as the work what I had been so far to uh, make at least some point of view that you can take up your research career in the future. I also thank uh, HRDC for organizing this workshop and giving me an opportunity to be part of it. Thank you, Varanda. I hope uh, I can start my presentation. I'll share my slides. Uh, it is uh, usually on silk material. Shall I proceed? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think you can proceed. Yeah. Yes, sir.
hope all of you can see this slide. Yes, sir. It's visible. Yes, sir. But kindly put it in slideshow mode. Yeah, I'm just searching where it is exactly. Okay. Can you see now? No, sir. It's not in uh, slideshow mode still. Okay, it's clear. It's passed. Why? Can you see now? Yeah. Is visible? Yeah. Must be visible? Yes, sir. It's correct. Yeah. Fine. Thank you. Yes, sir. We can see. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, and thank you all for waiting nearly for one hour, 15 minutes to open my lecture. Anyway, so I'm just, uh, since this course is in bioresources, of course, in silviculture, we have many bioresources, but uh, I picked up only one, the silk, as you all know. However, in uh, since long time, we have been uh, known the silk is uh, just a material which is being used for fabric. But in recent years, it has got a very good attention as a very good biomedical material or bi very good bi biomaterial for medical applications. So these are the cocoons what I have seen and it has been used just to produce the silk and then fabric. But nowadays, we can able to develop scaffolds. But not only the scaffolds, it has a long history. But in the ancient time, the silk fiber has been used as a, you know, silk suture. And then now the scientists are developing a screw for bone fractures remedies. For further, the silk fibrin solution has been extracted and it has been used for developing as not only the scaffold as we've seen, but also a 3D structure which can able to address some of these deep wound as well as other, uh, other aspects, which is to be called as 3D by printing. And this is how I go. So especially we are all know about this uh, cell fiber material. Basically it is a protein polymer. And this protein polymer has consists of, uh, you know, the outermost layer, the sericin, which is a gray substance. Whereas in case of inside that, there are two brain, which is called two bay, which is called as two brains. And then these two are crystalline fibrine structure. So this silk fibrin and the sericin forms a silk material, as we have seen. But both sericin as well as the fibrin has a lot of biomedical application nowadays. So therefore, it has got an attention of our you know, scientists a long way. Basically, the silk fibrin is made of by heavy chain as well as the light chain. Both of them put together and surrounded by a blue substance, the sericin. So the heavy chain and uh, the light chain of fibrin is connected with a disulfide bond. Here you can see this is the bond. So ultrastructure, if you see, then uh, inside there is a two braille which are called as a, which, which is composed of fibrin brain. This fibrin brain is not a simple structure, but it is having basically it is a protein which is having a thread-like structures and then. It is having both, uh, you know, the pad-like structure, which is and then coiled structure. So the beta sheet is most important to take up this fibrin or the regenerated fibrin as a biomaterial. The retaining this structure is most important to consider it as a biomaterial. So if you look towards this uh, fibrin, it has having the hydrophilic region as well as hydrophobic region. Whereas in case of N terminals and C terminals having a very good opportunity survival ample scope, wherein we can able to tag any one of these antibodies into that and towards this, lot of work is being pro progressed. 
However, this alpha, the heavy chain as well as the low chain has connected with the disulfide bond. Therefore, they are being together. So, we'll try, uh, results. We, we, we try to separate this uh, uh, heavy chain as well as the low chain. Therefore, we have cleaved this with uh, SGS. And when we are subject to four electrophoresis, we could able to get the fibrin chain as well as the low chain separately. And we are focusing on the heavy chain as well as the low chain which can be used as a very good material rather than having the silk alone. And this is how we are looking towards. And uh, we're trying to make this heavy chain and long chain has its own properties or together they have a good properties. So, uh, as we all know that it is uh, the silk which is spun by silk foam is a natural biological polymer. It is having a lot of uh, mechanical properties. Therefore, it has been used as a very good scaffold to see the growth and development of cells, which can able to replace the cellular matrix in the human body or wherever that is a circle. Moreover, it is having environmental stability. It does not change its structure as that of the impact of elemental conditions. There is not the factor, but of oh, most of this uh, material which is being used in the human uh, healthcare system, most of them are chemicals which is not having any biocompatibility. But the silk fibroin or the silk has very good biocompatibility. In addition to that, it is also having biodegradability. So therefore, if you use the silk fibroin in any of this aspect, it has its own degradability and depends upon the conditions required. It is also have a morphological flexibility. So therefore, we could able to give a proper shape in accordance with that of your need. Then the ability for amino acid side modifications to normalize growth factors is supporting the growth and development of cells. As a result, now many cell lines nowadays, including the stem cell lines, are also impregnated with these cell fibrin foods. And when it is placed into the system, probably I'm going to show you all those, which is going to support to regain the structure that is called as regeneration of the tissues. Because of all these uh, fantastic properties that has the silk fibroin and the silk, now the silk has been used as one of the potent material, which is uh, biomaterial. Of course, it has having a long story, a long history. As you all know that very long back, the silk fibroin or the silk material will be used as a suture. But now it is navigated to a new discipline in the modern era, which is called as tissue engineering applications, where you're going to regenerate the tissues in the human body. Because of its mechanical as well as chemical properties, now the site has been used. Based on this information, as we have a question, can the silk is a biomaterial? Yes, it is a biopolymer and biomaterial. It is not a synthetic biomaterial or a biopolymer. It is a natural biopolymer. So therefore, the ambiguity what we have with respect to the natural uh, material against the synthetic material is changing. Rather than using a sy synthetic or the chemical based polymer nowadays, most of all are agree with that as that of the grain that is silk fiber. Because of this unique nature, the Food and Drug Administration has approved as one of the potential material for biomedical applications. Since, since this biomaterial is a biopolymer having a very good degradability, biodegradability, and then it can be used as a potent biomaterial and it is approved. With this, since long time, the scientists have been working on that. It is, I would like to you know, show you just a timeline how this silk biomaterial is not only confined to manufacture of the fabric, but it is having very good wide applications in biomedical field. Take a look, have a look here. Especially, it has a long history of 5000 to 2000 BC. I'm not sure what we are thinking about the biomedical science. It is already well established. 
In 150 AD, the Gallienus is the one who used the silk fiber as silk suture. Later, the Ambrose Perry in the during World War, then he started using the silk suture for vascular surgery. And even today, the people have been using the silk material or silk fiber as a variable suture. Since the being used the suture in various application does not cause any damage to the human system, later, the or subsequently, the scientists know the importance of the silk fiber as a result, they started using some of other materials like now we can use the nanoparticles to announce the quality as well as the property of the silk and then silk coating suture have been used starting from 1930s until 1980s. So in then having this no significance of this silk suture and then the silk fibroin has been regenerated from the cocoon and started using it as very good scaffold. If you develop the silk material, either as a scaffold or the film or any matter, then that is going to help full to incorporate the drugs, what we require to heal the skin or the wounding area. And most of the scientists and most of the research work has been focused on wound healing or wound care. So, Subsequently, the scientist has proved that it is not only helping to wound care or curing the wounds as that of the suture does it so far, but it can also be replace the tissues and then it can also rejoin the fractured bones and as a result, they could be able to develop a surgical, application, surgical materials. Toward this, the scientists wanted to you know, change this silk fibra and material through recombinant DNA technology by using this part of silk. So therefore, they could able to develop uh, hydrogels as well as the nanoparticles where it can use at a very good polymer where it can be, you know, exhibit a slow drug, where it can be used as a slow drug delivery device. Having these many applications, especially now, the concept of in modern biology in the mind in the recent days, especially from 1918 till 2024, over the six years, a lot of publications being done. And most of uh, many you know, companies are coming forward to develop this, or uh, among them are serious surgical scaffold, AMSIL, these are the many, you know, the material being produced by different companies. But as it has a very good biomedical applications as well as implications now. The scientists, of course, including me, we are trying to develop the bio ink. The bio ink is the one which is the research concept where you can have 3D bioprinted bio ink, which incorporate the cell lines of to promote the growth and development, not only for the medical application, but also deep wound healing as well as as the heart infected. Of course, these are the some of the issues which I'm going to present before you now. And this is how the timeline where the silk has been emerged as a potent biomedical material or biomaterial towards biomedical applications. As I said, especially, see, the gladius is the one you use, use the silk as the biomedical applications. And nearly 1,800 years ago, the first anatomist Greek physician Galan, he started mentioning in his book, the silk and the cat gut is the one who can be used as the suture. And it is called as a surgical thread. And this surgical thread being used in the surgical uh, events that are cat gut, the silk, linen, and the cotton. But among them, the silk has got very good the potential applications. Over the years, the polyamide nylon is also being used. So th then now the competition between the polyester, polyacrylamide, polyamide, however, these are the chemical based, but the surgical material must be as a material. So therefore, the silk is the one with enhanced properties. And knowing this significance, especially the silk suture is being available commercially as silk sutures. And this is the silk fiber, which has been converted as a silk suture and it is readily available, both in the form of a packet and everything is that. So, because it is a soft, 
tissue it is having the property of uh, soft tissue approximation it is very good for ligation including cardiovascular ophthalmic and neurological procedures so the silk was the most common natural suture supposing the collagen collagen and other material being used in medical industries the question is when the silk is the one which is not going to provide you all the essential growth factors to support the growth and development of the tissues, as well as the antimicrobial properties to destroy the pathogens which are present in the womb. And it has to be have a tensile strength as well as because it is having a very good tensile strength and load bearing capacity is also to more. When you are using for tissue regeneration and then cartilage, and it's supposed to have a, a strong load bearing capacity as well as antimicrobial property. To announce this antimicrobial property of the silk fiber, then we made an attempt by using ZMO nanoparticles. What we did here is to announce this, the antimicrobial property of this silk suture or silk fiber to use as a very good suture, then we started integrating the ZNO nonparticles into the silk fiber. These are the silk fiber what we use, and then we started processing the silk fiber with the ZNO particles. Therefore, the ZNO nonparticles start depositing on the silk fiber. When it is deposited on the silk fiber, it not only increasing the tensile strength to bear the load bearing capacity to improve the tensile strength. So it not only increasing the tensile strength as we reported already in the paper from materials chemistry and physics, but also it is increasing antimicrobial property. So therefore, rather using the raw silk fiber as a suture with the somewhat improved biological property, biomedical properties, antimicrobial properties, when we started using this the demonor particles, it enhanced not only the load bearing capacity, but also antimicrobial property. So therefore, we propose the Jadeno nanoparticles fabricated silk fiber for surgical applications. And it has been the one way where you can be able to use the silk fiber for a lot of biomedical applications. So interestingly, as I did mention, the silk fiber being used as a scaffold, it can hold the drugs for a longer period and accommodate the cells, then um, as it is what is going to happen, whatever the drugs we are going to use, it is can regulate to release these medical compounds or in the form of drugs, either to be peptides or be any nanoparticles or anything, it can put into the tissue and then it can release these drugs slowly as, as a very good step forward. In addition to that, especially whatever the cells which we supposed to grow in the in vitro conditions, but it need aseptic conditions, and then growth, growth and development of this is also be difficult. In such case, the scientists have been using the silk scaffold imbibed with the cancer cells as 3D cancer models. You know that the 3D cancer models once you have developed. It can be used to screen anti-cancer drugs or compounds. And you can also know how these drugs can interact with the cells. So therefore, the cancer progression mechanism can also be unraveled because the 3D cancer model, which is the silk scaffold, it is having a compatible microenvironment system. Because of this, New cutting edge technologies are developing by using both mulberry as well as non mulberry. If any one of you are in the field of this drug discovery or the delivery system to be used, then you can also think of using the silk fibroin scaffold or the filler as slow drug delivery device. However, now we can say that a lot of uh, the silk based biomaterials are available. I'm going to show you all the list of material at the end of my presentations. But apart from those materials that are available here, you can also think of developing a new material by imbibing or incorporating your uh, drug or 
nanoparticles or anyway internal materials, you can put it here and see that how it is going to be used. Of course, I can say that this silk-based scapegoat is a very good material, not only to have your drugs inside, but also it released to the system as and when you require. And this is how you can able to control. So that I could able to say it's a very good biomaterial. It is not a synthetic material. It is the biomaterial. And it is uh, where in the synthetic material has lack of biodegradability, biocompatibility, and the silk material has both of these. So therefore, it is open ample scope for all of you to take a challenge in this silk-based research. I welcome you all to this uh, new era of the silk-based research. And it is not the story with me or only one. You can see that across the world, there are large or huge number of scientists or involved in the research, which has been published in 2019. Have a look here, there are a large number of publications have been published. Of course, some of the publications not published or some of the findings are not published. They keep it themselves for the patenting. And there are many patent issues also there. As, however, we could able to see there are more than 500 publications which is related to the vascular tissue. And there are 629 publications which is related to the skin. And there are nearly 400 with respect to the cartilage. As a result, uh, American scientists dealt the screw. I said that the suture to screw now. Earlier, suture was being used. Now, scientists being used, uh, developed the screw where you can use the screw to join both the cut bones together instead of using metallic screw. And this is how they can get into there. And if you look this percentage of reports which are being published with respect to the both mulberry and non-mulberry, you could see there is a lot of work has been doing the mulberry and still there is a ample scope over all of you to think of non-mulberry silk forms or when it's on the anterior millet or non-mulberry silks, you can also be used, which is having a different properties compared to that of the bombix mori. Depends upon your need. Either you can choose bombix mori silk or you can choose vada silk or you can choose non-mulberry silk and you can able to do this. And this is the glimpse of that total work is being done. If you look towards this bomb, as I said, the screw has been used for bomb fracture repair and bone regeneration. Nearly 943 publications as of now 2019, now 2024, many more has been published. And this is how a lot of research work has been or is going on across the country. Now you look into this new era of research, which is the best research and the development of that. Because of this continuous research we've been doing here, and then uh, there are different formats of silk protein as biomaterials available. That I'll show you what are those available, and I'll give you the list at the end. And what is my contribution toward this field of research work that also I can show you in terms of biomedical concern. So we are supposed to use the regenerated fibrin to develop a filler, the scaffold, and then nanoparticles in bio, hydrogels in the screw. This with respect to the fibroid. In case of the other proteinaceous material which is present in the silk is also a sericin. So now you can see the sericin and as well as the fibroid. Either you can take together and you can also prepare your own biomaterial which is having both sericin as the fibroid and the fibroid. Or you can use fibroid alone or you can use sericin alone. That you can think of yourself where you can be able to use either sericin or fibrin as a scaffold to incorporate your novel oh, biomedical compounds into it and then you can go for biomedical application either for wound healing or in case of a tissue repair or bone repair. So therefore, under the support of Bayrak as a DBT and then INSPIRE, we are trying to develop a 3D bioink, which is a new concept as it is uh, very well correlated with that of the theme of your lecture course in the modern science and technology. Just for like an example is to you, of course, there are many more things are available, but I don't want to, uh, you know, I, I don't want to put everything to a cross, but I can give an example, and best example is that the silk fibroid, not alone, but nanocomposites, is the one biomaterial being used for wound healing activity. The scientists being echo. Of course, in the 2024, there is a very good review on it 
this uh, silk fibron and this thana composite, you can have also have a look and it will tell you the entire story. So the, the most significant point is here. This is the damaged tissue which is being had point in the skin in any one of these extract. Then it goes through the homeostasis, the immunomodulatory dressings, and endocrine dressings. So wherein you can use silk fibrin based dressings, either in the form of performance or the films, which is available either on the for powder or hydrogels, electrospon mats, or films and sponges, even in the form of picture. So if you use any one of these, apply on the damaged skin, it supports the growth and development of the cells as well as prevent the bacterial development. And therefore, it can support healing of wound very well. And that is what we call as the wound healing procedures. You could see here the damaged tissue. When you use the silk fibril, the damaged tissue is grown such a way that it is in a normal state. And this is how the scientist has been proved through a silk-based wound care procedures and you have some products as well. So this wound care products has uh, some uh, special properties. They have a rapid blood clotting, so therefore it can be blocked. Earlier, we know that the scientists during the World War, whenever the, the soldiers are, you know, injured, they used to have the hot, the glass rod, and put it on the wound. Therefore, the broken skin used to join to stop the bleeding. But now, these are the one, either powder or results, a scab can stop the rapid blood clotting so that for the blood bleeding is not desired. As well as it is also exhibit very good immunomodulatory and antibiotic properties. Therefore, it can support the wound healing very fast. Since it contribute overall pro-healing properties, the wound healing mechanism is faster than that of any other chemicals. Therefore, the silk fibroid is the one which has been used as a potent wound healing product. This is one of the example to you. So, the same Indra Kumar has been compared with respect to the other products which are available in the market. They are the collagen, alginate, and the silpatrite. You can just imagine the, the source of this collagen is bovine, and alginate is brown seawood. And silk fibrin can be isolated from the cocoons which are commercially producing in the farms. It has, they have really, you know, analyzed very well their advantages as well as the disadvantages and the limitations. Accordingly, they could say that the silk fibrin is one of the best material. Toward this direction, there are certain companies or also come forward to produce silk fibrin based wound healing products. They are the Fibrohil, Skylay, Suffragon, and Clisbo. So these are the companies now. They are putting concerted effort to develop the novel products, which silk based products towards the wound care procedures. And this is how the silk fibrin being used towards the wound healing. As I did mention, especially now, most of the companies and many scientists been involved to produce a different products. Among them, the improved product for the suture is the one derived from fibroin of both Bambitsmuri as someone and Thremilator depends upon the one. So you see here the silk fibroin based which have been used, it is showing a smooth flow through tissue. When you are inserting this, the suture, it has to go smoothly in the skin and then it could able to join, ligate both the cut skin and indicate for use in general soft tissue perfection and as well as ligation. So therefore, this has been used. Basically, it is a monofilament 
and you can also have a multi-filament fibers and then you can be able to use. And what is the need of this and what is the applications? This silk future will use towards tendon tissue engineering, narrow guides, stands, and surgical material. And these are the different applications of the suture. Scent is also developed by using the silk fibrin as a fillups. The films are not exactly from the fibrin, but also from the silicon as well. And both of them has its own features. And now you could able to see here, the silk fibrin derived from the cocoon is converted as a silk composite fillup. This is the fillups which is being used as, uh, in, 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 instead of, uh, uh, you know, we are using bandaid. When we got a small injury, we use the bandaid and we are going to use the bandaid on the, you know, just cover the bandaid on the, the, the uh, wound and leave it for a while. And then it can, in, in place of that bandaid now, the scientists are using these fillups, which is having very good properties. So, Basically, it has having a certain capture features. It is having a two dissolvent tested, the transparent films with the nano features ranging from one to 12 mm, nanometer frequency films by PDMS sample. And its application is for bone, cardiac, vascular tissue engineering, and biomaterial design, tissue engineering, drug delivery. And if you have you, if you loaded your drugs into this biofilm, it can slowly release and therefore it can facilitate the wound growth and development. In addition to that, they are also developing a sponge. They can also use it as a gel as well. And this sponge, silver fibrin gel, being used or developed by using the fibrin as well as the silicon. And this has a little bit of features and the applications with respect to this. Uh, the sponge is bone, cartilage, and And this is how the sponge has an application where in case of electrospun mats also has a different application. These electrospun mats having a diameter 50 to nanometer is available. It is uh, using for uh, very good uh, different applications. Again, it is on bone, atypontrial, nerve, ocular skin, skeletal muscle, vascular products, wound resins, drug delivery. And these are the different formats of the silk fibrin and the is av are, are available. Besides, not only in the form of a film or the spawn, the scientists are also developing have microparticles. So the particle size is less than three micrometer. These are prepared by salvation or mechanical communications. So this has very good properties with respect to bioactive molecule and their drug delivery. So these are the silk uh, fibroin SEM images for further applications. Besides the microparticles, they also developed the nanoparticles. The nanoparticles are derived from a developed from sericin as well as the fibroin. These nanoparticles are ranging from 2 to 500 nanometer, which has very good biomedical properties. These are developed or fabricated by capillary and micro dissolution, electro spraying, micro emulsion, and supercritical fluid. It is having a very good applications as well for tissue engineering, drug biotechnology delivery. These are all the different formats which are available as of now and produced by the different companies. The scientists are also developing hydrogels, especially these hydrogels are using as the gels for wound healing. If the wound is dry, then you can use the gel. If the wound is bleeding, then you can use the mats. And this is how various applications have been done. And the fibril is the one who is really doing a lot of work. And uh, this hydrogel is also having a different very good properties. And then basically it is being used for drug delivery and tissue engineering. Most importantly now, having all these different formats, which are having a very good uh, potential biomedical applications, the scientists, look on, uh, the scientists are looking towards the new avenues. As it is, we, especially, as I can say that, especially if you have an analysis, when, we met with an accident by a scooter or whatever it may be, we could be able to have a different types of wound, the surface wound and deep wound. Even the suture is also at the critical 
critical surgery or normal surgery, whatever it may be. When the critical surgery is there, the loading bearing capacity of this thread switcher should be wrong. And then when you met with the accident, and then you can say that if the wound is surfaced, and then you can just use a bandit. Otherwise, if you see the doctor having patch of a stack of the cotton, stack of the microfiber, and they put all the gels and everything, then they will pack it up. Now, depends upon the depth of the wound, depends upon the size of the wound. Now, we can able to develop a 3D printed sulfabrine matrix or the scaffold in, incorporated with all the drug and growth related factors. And then you can just put into the ohm if it is a deep ohm. Therefore, this is going to cover all the surface area of the deep ohm because it is 3D printed and then very well fixed into that ohm and support. As a result, what we did, we also thought, thinking of developing a 3D prints with respect to depends upon the ohm. So this ohm is going, we are going to take this X-ray images and converted it into a 3D structure. And based on the 3D structure, we are going to develop a 3D prints. And this is how 3D print silk fibrine based 3D prints. I think it is basically from the fibrine, but not in the sericin. But small amount of sericin can also be used to support this glue in nature. However, it needs very systematic approach to develop a product of that requisite in, 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 in requisite to drugs or composite materials in that. And therefore, this 3D printing mechanism is uh, 3D printing procedure is in the way now. Scientists already achieved some of this goal. There are they, they this method used for 3D printing is direct ink writing, which is called a DAW. Micro extrusion, the self curable binds by adding polyols for cross linking and geometry. And now, UV cure 3D printing is also there. So, these are the one which is being used 3D printed material for tissue engineering, optical waveguides, especially for bone fracture repair. And let us have a look what are the different types of the 3D printed materials are available. So, now we could see a different whatever the Films, sponges, we have seen earlier. Now, it is the one which is more attractive to me as well. We can able to develop a different traps. And the screw, what you see here, is not the metallic screw. It is a screw which is developed by using the fiber material. So, the importance of this is if you, of course, these are all available online. You can also go through these uh, reports and you can able to and get more information about this and we can think of where you can able to stand from the point of its medical application is concerned. So as I understand is, there, especially when the bone is fractured and they are keeping away, then to close these two fractures, the side of the data is being used a metallic screw and they remind and they retain that screw in the body itself. Once the bone is healed up, then either you have to retain the screw there itself or the doctor has to remove. I say again, again, they have to do the surgery and then you have to remove. Otherwise, if the metal is true, it remains for longer. But now the scenario is gradually changing. Instead of using the metallic screw, which is not going to degrade it on its own in accordance with that of the growth and development of the bones, but now this biodegradable the silk fibron based screw having the drugs in it. But now we are developing a bioink, which is going to support the bone growth and development and matrix as well. But however, we can use this. So as the bone is healing up, the screw is not only hold these two fractured bones together, but also it provides essential compounds which can facilitate accelerate the growth and development of the bone. So therefore, the bone regeneration can be faster and accurate. As a result, the scientists from USA, of course, they have already had a more than uh, tons of uh, patents on it, and India has to get up further. And now I really you know, think anyone of you in this line of interest can forward and uh, start doing the work on this line. Therefore, I'm presenting you before them.
So, as this fibronar silk material being used across the country for various biomedical applications in India, and of course, there are some scientists in India also, they're doing their research work in uh, IIT Delhi, at different places. But what exactly I'm contributing toward this a small piece of, uh, and this wide field of research and small piece of work. And here, especially under Bayerak project support and then uh, DSC Inspire program and uh, CMR program, we started using and the in-house produced silk material. So these are the cocoons we are not borrowing from the market. Why? Because please keep in mind, if you go to the market, and there are various types of cocoons which are derived from a various climatic conditions, which are derived from various places, which has a different properties. Of course, this is now is uh, came to you know aware that different types of cocoons having a different properties, where especially amid one, amid two, and the crystalline structure, especially beta shades and crystal structure, is most important to maintain for consistency as well as reproducibility. So therefore, we produce the cocoons in our own. Uh, only one type of quality rather than mixing. Of course, uh, we use the same cocoons and then we successfully isolated the silk fibrin solution as well as the silicon solution. And using the silk fibrin solution, and then we also prepared the very beautiful fill-ups. And if any one of you wanted this type of fill-ups, of course, we can able to produce. We can incorporate the drugs into these fill-ups and we can test it for in vitro and in vivo studies. Similarly, we used the silk fibrin, silk silicon as well, isolated from the same cocoon, and then we dealt with the fill-ups. And these fill-ups has different properties, as well as different character features, as well as a different application purposes that we have to be figured out very well. That depends upon your need. However, be careful. Whatever the fill-ups you're using, whatever the scaffold you're using, they should have the same properties. If you're using different cocoons, if these films and everything is different and your expected results is going to be different, and this is the constraints, what many of the scientists across the globe is facing, we also come across different types of uh, difficulties. So therefore we have analyzed different types of cocoons and then we are now seeking on confined to the particular type of cocoons which is produced in our department. So, we can produce, I, I can give you some silk fibrin solution or the films for our medical applications. So when we have successfully isolated the silk fibrin solution, we call it as a regenerated silk fibrin solution. The regenerated silk fibrin solution is not from the commercial, this is the one which is produced in our laboratory and it is published in uh, 2016 in Ceramics International. From this silk fiber solution, of course, you can also think that it is also very good. And then we developed the scaffolds. This is molded, the molded feature is the scaffold. And then we can able to concentrate this in the form of Teflon. And this is how we can able to have your different shapes of the scaffolds and the mold where we can able to use for biomedical applications. Of course, you can also convert it in the form of powder. And if you use this powder, which is our, which are lipolized, and we can able to re, re, you know, retain it, but longer the period, degeneration of this protein. And this is the main constraint. So therefore, we're supposed to use the silver and solution for preparation of the scaffold and mold as much as fresh. And this is the one limitations, and we need to follow it up. However, Whatever the scaffold, whatever the silk fiber solution we produce, but most importantly, keep it in mind, its structure should be mine. So therefore, if you're using different types of cocoons, different source of bioresource material, if the structure is changing, its application output is also changing. Therefore, we always look for, you also look for, and most of the scientists is before going to develop any product, you should look for the random coil configurations. The silk one configuration, which is say R4, and the silk two, as I already told you before, what is the silk one or the silk two, and the beta sheet is the one which is going to give the toughness 
and the silk one is the one which is going to give the variable structure. And if this scaffold is, of course, I'm going to show you the scaffold structure as well. If the scaffold structure is fine, then it can hold the drugs and then it can release the drugs as much as possible. So therefore, we will see here the beta sheet conformation is most important, which is to be similar to that of the silk fiber. And that is also some of the scientists model and told me believe that, and we have to be stick on to that. So therefore, when you're subjected for FTAR, look for the spectral signature at 1625, 1520, 1250, 69, and then it is going to tell you what is exactly. There are am at one, am at two, am at three, and that four maps. If your silk fiber solution is depicting this type of spectral signature, and this is the one which is good for you to go further. Otherwise, you're not supposed to do that. Now, as I said, this FTA spectra is the one which is going to confirm the stability of the beta sheet to go for the scaffold development or bion development. If not, your scaffold is not going to good, your bion is not going to good, and whatever application you're going to do is not going to be useful. And finally, your application is in vain. So be careful with that. This is what we are going to say that. And fine, you focused on the structural property of this fiber and scaffolds, but what is its biological activity? So therefore, since the biocompatibility, the, the biological property of this silk fiber solution is not that, you know, reached to the expected level, then we plan to announce the biological properties by using the scaffolds by using the glass beads. So what we did is here, we yes, it's here. So what we used is that we started using spray dried mesophorous bioactive glass beads. These are the glass beads. So when you start using the glass beads and then we started to fill this, the scaffold. These are the scaffold, what I to say you that. These are the scaffold. So these are the scaffolds what I say that, and this is the one which is going to hold your drugs because the scaffold has a very good porosity in it. And the porosity creation is also most important that is going to determine based on the structural property of regenerative silver fiber. So therefore we should be very careful. So then you can have a 6% uh, silk or maybe 8% or maybe 10%. That is depends upon how far, how, 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 how your plan and how your target is determined. So when we use this for either the spray dried mesophorous glass beads with a soldier method, then we could able to see all these glass beads is, I don't know, here you could see that they are very well sitting in that. So when they are sitting in that, then we see how they are going to grow further. So this is when we observe under the microscope with respect to the different days, it can show the growth, growth and development of the cellular pattern as has been depicted by a different scientist. They are using the scaffolds and they could able to see the growth and development of fibroblast cells here, then human mesochymal cells, stem cells, and then red bone marrow cell morphology. You can able to see how it is going to grow by using this scaffold and then human breast cancer cells. This is a one which I said a 3D model of cancer cells. And then we have to test life and dead as of this bone contact cells. So as the scientist has been using the cells careful for various studies where it is promoting the good growth and development of the cellular matrix, we also tested with the bioglass that also true on very good growth and development. And we could able to see how this is going to prove, support the good growth and development of uh, the cellular matrix. And this is how we come across that the composite scaffolds prepared by freeze drying 
is indicating very good growth and development of the cellular matrix. This is the one which is supported us that we can also go further based on this force what you developed in the laboratory to develop bio ink. So we started using the sulfibroin, the sulfibroin solution, and then we subjected again to determine whether this sulfibroin regenerated silk fiber has retained the property. And these are the new silicon cocoons what I did mention, NBH1 with the digamon one, NBH1 with the cocoon, and the filler. We made a comparison. And then what was the filler we developed? And that they, this is my retaining the amid one peak and amid two peak, wherein it exhibit higher crystalline index, higher beta shoots. And this is the confirmative which you require wherein it announces mechanical properties. If it is retain the mechanical properties, if it is announcing the mechanical properties, and then only you could able to say, yes, this is the one silver solution, good to go for by preparation. Now, good to go. But see that this silver what you are going to have, free it should be devoid of the series and you could see the C fiber. When you have the fibroin, the word of the fibroin, then you could able to achieve this type of uh, fibroin, regenerative fibroin solutions, wherein amid group exhibit very good crystalline structure with beta shoots. With that, we develop very good hydrogels. As I said, now you see this hydrogel. This hydrogel is the very good material to load the drugs of your interest and you can use it as an ant man. And the scientists are looking towards this now. Of course, you could ask me a question. Why not you go for developing some kind of gel-based uh, the medicines? Of course, I can do everything. But this is how I'm just bringing to you where you can pick up any one of this and check up your research work and help the society in this direction because the silver draw and the silver material is the potential material. So we prepared the hydrogel by using the silver fiber solution, which is developed in our lab. I'm repeatedly telling you that these are the silver fiber solution, which are not commercially available. These are the silver fiber solution, which have been isolated from our laboratory and developed this hydrogel. And then we substituted for analysis for FTS spectra, and then you could able to see is there is any variation with amid one and amid group and no change does occur. So you could able to go further. As a result, now we could able to use this infrared solution for developing a 3D bioprints. And this is the 3D bioprints which we constructed by using the silver solution, whatever I showed you so far, and this is the 3D printing machine. Now, let us have a look how this 3D prints works. Have a look now. This is a 3D printing machine, a loaded with the silver solution, with nanomaterials, and then growth tabulators. We are trying to incorporate the cell lines, especially into this, and we could able to see this 3D printing machine is printing the 3D structure of fibroid. And this is what I say is 3D printed silk fibroid based construct, which are going to use it for different biomedical applications. As of now, we are focusing on to address the maggiofacial defects and myocardial issues. Of course, I can show you one more interesting story where these 3D prints having a very significant role. See now, and the 3D printing is depends upon the type of the wound, the size of the wound, shape of the wound, and that has to be constructed on our own where the 3D printing technology has all these facilities. If you ask me, 
Is this 3D printing facilities are available in India? Yes, it is available and is the one which has been used in collaboration with some industries. Of course, this Bayrak project is in collaboration with uh, Accurate Lab, Bangalore, JSS Dental College, and then Nanotechnology Company in Bangalore. And now, this is a 3D printing machine and it can print the circular type, it can print the square type, the smaller size or a bigger size. And these are the print with Jewelab, which has a lot of American applications. Let us have a look how this, the recent days in 2021, we could have see that the 3D printing machine is constructing a patches which is called as silk-based 3D bioprinted vascularized cardiac patches. And not in India, but in the US, they are developing silk-based the cardiac patches. These are the three cardiac patches are developing, and then wherever the tissue damage is occur in the heart, they are going to place it over there, and there it can able to cure the ischemic tissue damage can do that. For which the people say that engineering innovative 3D material constructs that can effectively interface cardiac tissues that mimic their native tissue niche, boost their functional performance, and at the same time display potential towards clinical transplantation in an active field of research. This is the emerging field now. When these patches can be incorporated into the heart, why can't in any of the tissues? So we can also think of that where mulberry and non mulberry based conductive buoying comprising the carbon nanotubes is the one which is carbon nanotube to bioprint functional 3D vascularized anisotropic cardiac constructs. And if I say it has a lot of applications, and this is how the scientists are involved across the country to use the silk as one of the potent biomaterial, and the silk is the biomaterial. And this is what I could say that the biomaterial has a lot of application in the biomedical field. Let me have a appraise you what are the different uh, types of uh, materials that are available here and what are the tests being done, what are the conclusions. Now you can see that this is the mats, wherein they have tested by using HDF and uh, at, uh, cell lines, HACAT cell lines, which improved the cell addition and antibody property. And these are the mats from the sericene. And these are the mats from copper dog. And the, these are the scaffold with the zinc. And of course, the zinc oxide I will show another. And these are the scaffold with the different, where they have tried with the different HEPG2, rat, haptocytes. And then they have an opinion that it is having a functional bio artificial liver and laminar scaffold. And these are the different uh, films, battered films, the scaffolds, the hydrogel. And these are all the different formats of the silk fibroin or silicon based materials are readily available, but still it has a uh, good score for all of you to make use of these films or the gels, the mats to use as best material to incorporate your medicinal compounds to test against any one of these diseases. And this is how I could say that undoubtedly the silk material is a potent biomaterial has very good applications. With this, I conclude my talk. Thank you, Nana. Hello? Is anybody there? Yes, sir, we are there. Yes, sir, all of us there. Yeah, yeah.
So I hope I am uh, very clear with my presentation to all of you. If you have any doubts, you can, you know, call me or if you want any kind of support towards this type of research work, you are most welcome.